that this nation shall have an abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law. And so long as our nation keep an abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law, Almighty God shall prosper this nation. Almighty God, through our founding fathers, gave us his recipe to prosper our nation. And the Bahamas was ordained to be his shining example among other nations in our region and around the world. If you please, spiritual Israel. Honorable members, restore the abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law throughout the length and breadth of our nation, of our capital, and our family of islands. And the winds of God's pros prosperity shall blow from the four corners of this earth towards our nation one more time in record time, thoughts for the day, and for immediate implementation, Almighty God is speaking. And I quote, Jeremiah 29, 7, also keep the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Honorable members, get to know and implement the plans God has ordained for our nation. For God's plan to already bless. 2 Corinthians 7 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father. We thank you for releasing to our honorable leaders and to this nation afresh and anew the keys to the true prosperity for our nation. May your people carry out the work, for the work is not burdensome but profound. Prayer is the work, and the work is in the prayer. Bless, I pray thee, the deliberations of our honorable members today. In Jesus' name, Praying to gather the prayer, he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, name thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, upon the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Good morning, honorable members. In the spirit of honoring those who have gone before us in this place, as well as other 
stalwart citizens of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, we wish to pause and recognize all heroes of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas who have set the foundation upon which this generation and generations to come will build. For those who have already passed, we wish to take a moment of silence in their recognition. Thank you, honorable members, a moment of silence. Thank you, honorable members. When the business of the House suspended on Thursday last, the honorable member for Kalani had reserved the floor. The chair now recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Cat Island, Rumpkin, and on Salvador. A, on a point of privilege. Um, honorable member, on a point of privilege, I tried to reach you this morning, but they told me you were not, and I spoke to the clerk to indicate, to indicate the matter which I wish to raise. The headlines in the newspapers this morning that suggested that the government, the previous government, engage in criminal conduct. That's a very serious allegation to be made, and was made by none other than the Minister of Finance. So I, I, I raised that on a matter of privilege because it, um, I find that I am offended by it. It breaches my privilege in the context that I was a member of the government. It, it, it didn't, he didn't have to make it in here. He does not have to make the statement in here. Because we, 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 we will deal with it out there. It will be dealt with out there. But as a member of this House, Mr. Speaker, the headline suggests that 42, first of all, it started, Mr. Speaker, from the, from the Minister of Finance suggesting that <coughs> 42 million in hurricane relief money can't be found. That was, that was carried in the Guardian on f Friday, October 6th. On that same day, no, he did not, I'm saying the headlines, he did not correct that. No, 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 no I am worried about the headlines because this is what is in the public domain. Um, um, the speaker. Honorable member, honorable member, um, state, state the infraction. The infraction is, Mr. Speaker, the headlines of the newspapers this morning suggest uh, and, and a statement released by the Minister of Finance Honorable member, yes, you, you, you are aware that the, the rules require that you give the chain notice as well as produce your statement and all of the information to the chair prior to, being, to, to, present, to present, presenting Mr. your point. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there's no, Mr. Uh, not a question of, 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 of uh, giving you a written communication. Mr. Speaker, when, when no, no, no. The, the, at, at the very on, at the honorable, earliest opportunity. Honorable member, the issue is notice. Notice. You should give the chair notice yeah, yeah, Mr. of Mr. the privilege. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I spoke that, to the clerk this morning to communicate to the clerk that I wish leave to raise this matter this morning. That is sufficient notice in my view. No, no. If the you're suggesting... If you are say, suggesting that I don't need, to, I could speak to the clerk, to the speaker. If that is not the way you want it done, then let, let us know. But I am accustomed. The, the headlines, the newspaper. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I, uh, grandstanding? When someone accuse me of a criminal conduct, you call that grandstanding? Huh? 
Huh? You're calling that grandstanding? Mr. Speaker, the member, on, on, the, minister, the Minister of Finance suggested, honorable right, that member. as part of the government, honorable we, member. Honorable attempt, member. we spent 42 million to buy the election. That's Hon what he did. Honorable member. Honorable member. The point the chair is making. What the point? What chair? What the, point the chair is making? The, the point the chair is making is that the rules require that you. What rules give, you're pointing to, Mr. Give notice. <laughs> Which rule you talk? Honorable Member. Yes, yes, no, I, 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 I'm you, listening. You're familiar with the rule, right? Yes, I am. And Which rule are you talking about? 37 4. It says any member. 37 4. I'm looking at Any I'm member. I'm reading. I'm which has suddenly arisen and requires the immediate intervention of the House. And he shall move that a contempt or breach of privilege has been committed, and the matter be referred to the Committee of Privilege and Procedure. So if the matter is raised in the Committee of the Whole of House, uh, and, and so you if the matter is raised you, in Committee you, you, of the you, Whole House, the Chairman shall be removed. Now, Mr. Speaker, so Mr. Speaker I, first of all, I point out, but it's not here, though. I point out, Honorable Member, yes, Mr. Speaker. if we read from um, Rule 4, subsection 4 of 37, it says that you should, let me read it in its full context. Any member complaining of a matter arising before commencement of a sitting. This is a matter arising before commencement of a sitting, right? As, as a breach of privilege, or contempt shall produce to the speaker, not the clerk, the speaker, a copy of the publication containing the matter complained of. Uh, now, and, and seek leave of the speaker. The final sentence, and seek leave of the speaker to raise the matter as a breach of privilege. And, and I'm simply saying that I didn't receive any notice. I was, I was in this house from 9 a.m. And I'm saying that I, it's difficult for me to determine what you are about to say without having received the notice. And so the chair is not minded to, to allow you to proceed at this time until if you wish to raise the matter later, you can give me the notice and give me the opportunity to see if there is indeed a breach of privilege and the chair then can make a ruling on whether it is a breach of privilege. I will accept. Right, but I, I, I will accept. But I, I, I wish just to point out, one, that the matter only came to my attention recently, a few hours ago, because it's just in this morning's uh, papers that the headlines came out, which I'm speaking, with the story of which I'm speaking, is a breach of our privilege. Right? And, and, that is, and that is when I am speaking about what <coughs> came out this morning. And so I will produce, I'll, I'll produce the... I'll produce the article, the newspaper publication, and, and his press and the press release that inform that article uh, for the purposes of your consideration. Sometimes. Thank you, honourable member. The chair recognizes the honourable member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when I stood last week, I made I mentioned that I would yield. I was holding the space for the member for Carmichael and therefore I yield to the member of Carmichael. <coughs> the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the wonderful people of Carmichael 
to thank our Governor General, Dame Marguerite Pinling, for her most impressive delivery of the governance agenda in the speech from the throne. Mr. Speaker, we all agree that our Governor General was most stately in our presentation, and we thank her for the dignified manner in which she represents us. I know, sir, that my classmate, colleague, and friend, Mr. Obi Pindling is beaming with pride, and I thank he and his siblings for their sacrifice in supporting their mother as she serves. Mr. Speaker, I also wish to thank you for permitting me to wear pink today. This tie and this band on my hand are in honor of all of the people who are impacted by cancer. This month, we recognize cancer awareness. But especially three people, sir. First, Mr. Speaker, my sister Donna, who succumbed to breast cancer a few years ago. I pray every day, sir, that I have just a little of her patience, her faith, and her awesome ability to love and to forgive. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I wear pink in honor of my special constituent, Ornette Fraser, an amazing woman who lost her fight with cancer last week Friday. Ornette had a remarkable, remarkable fighting spirit. And I offer my prayers, my condolences to her parents, Antoinette and Robert Fraser, Golden Gates Number 2, and her son, Denver Morse, as well as the Wingate Road family. Finally, Mr. Speaker, to my mentor and friend, Dr. B.J. Nordich, any number of us in this place would have benefited from B.J.'s guidance. It was an honor for me to follow in his footsteps as president of the B3As and to see the respect and the genuine affection that the sporting world held for him internationally. It's largely because of B.J.'s contributions that the Bahamas has been able to experience the level of success that we have enjoyed on the world stage in track and field. In politics, Mr. Speaker, BJ was a mediator for me. During the last administration, I could call BJ any time and speak with him about issues that were critical to our local sporting bodies. He always found the time to listen and to act in a manner that was helpful and beneficial to the country. Mr. Speaker, I wish to posthumously thank BJ for all that he did to make the Bahamas a better place for all of us. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to Carmichael. At the outset, sir, please permit me to offer condolences to Cleo Griffin of Golden Gates Number 2 on the passing of Bruce Seymour. I visited Cleo recently, and I shall keep her and her family in my prayers. People of Carmichael elected me to serve, sir, and serve I shall. However, Mr. Speaker, my mandate for Carmichael is strengthened by the fact that our Prime Minister chose two Carmichael constituents to serve in Cabinet with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, it's not an, by accident that the Honorable Members for North Abaco and Yamacross sit almost immediately behind me. They're both committed, long-time Carmichael residents. They both have my back, literally and figuratively. <laughs> and I'm grateful to our Prime Minister for his wonderful insight into Carmichael's significance in the big picture. Because we got three ministers in Carmichael. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, Carmichael will not let you down. <laughs> still, 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 outnumbered, still outnumbered by Carmichael. Carmichael outnumbers yeah. them all, Mrs. Speaker. <laughs> We're a royal flash, though. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, younger members may not rem remember this song or know it, but the lyrics to one of my favorite songs says that the second time around, it's better than the first time. 
I know Angliston remembers Shalimar. You got it right. <laughs> but this is my second honeymoon with Carmichael, and it keeps getting better. Mm -hmm. We started our work in Bel Air Park with the kind assistance of my colleagues, Minister for the Environment, and the enthusiastic MP for St. Barnabas. We were able to take truckloads of garbage out of Bel Air Park. Our next focus will be the piles of old tires and nasty people dumped in the park. We are stewards of our heritage, Mr. Speaker, and I urge my fellow Bahamians to take our environment seriously. There's even an old car dumped in the park. We can no, no longer tolerate this type of conduct in the Bahamas. So I support the Minister of the Environment as he begins his massive cleanup effort and as he seeks to strengthen our environmental protection laws. Mr. Speaker, we have already entrusted the Flamingo Gardens Park to mature, stable hands, and I look forward to watching our children safely compete in baseball, softball, tennis, and other activities there. And yes, sir, Mr. Speaker, I heard Southern Shores, but we will beat them and any other constituencies <laughs> who are bold enough to come to Flamingo Gardens to play against Carmichael. I ask Golden Gates number two and Silver Gates to have patience with me because I have a master plan for their parks also, one that they will be delighted with. Mr. Speaker, the same master plan will be applied to Capital Works in all of our major parks. And every MP in this place would know that I've had someone visit the parks in their constituencies, every single one. We will start with a few of them this fiscal year, beginning with protective walls and cabanas to complement the park restoration and reclamation work the Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture plans to engage in. Working together, sir, you will once again make our parks family-friendly places where communities again feel safe. Speaker, before I move on to the Ministry of Public Works, please permit me to congratulate and commend longtime Carmichael residents, retired justice and former Attorney General, former Senator Claire Hepburn, and her husband Bones, I'm amazed uh, at the exemplary work that they're doing with the Tara Xavier Hepburn Foundation. <coughs> we pledge our continued support for their amazing contribution in uplifting young people throughout the country. We're pleased to have them in Carmichael, but grateful, sir, that their work, humble as they think it is, extends so far and touches so many young lives in our country. This is the type of initiative, Mr. Speaker, that will complement the efforts of the Ministers of National Security, Minister of Education, Minister of Youth, Sports, and Culture, in supporting the wholesome development of our young people. I also want to thank the wonderful volunteers and members of Corporate Bahamas, who made the 2017 Carmichael Back to School Jamboree the biggest and best ever. We were able to give out in excess of 500 backpacks containing school supplies to young people in the community. We also provided school supplies to support the efforts of the police in the community. Mr. Speaker, the Carmichael police know that we are going to continue to work closely with them. They have our full support in their effort to eradicate crime and to guide our young people. Mr. Speaker, as I start, begin to touch on the Ministry of Public Works. When I speak about the Ministry of Public Works, I get goosebumps. I'm so excited about our potential to positively impact the entire country. I thank the Prime Minister for appointing me to serve in the country's most dynamic and most impactful ministry. Most days I pinch myself, Mr. Speaker, and I think of all the good that we can do throughout the ministry, through the Ministry of Public Works. Yeah. So I ask all Bahamians to fasten their seatbelts <coughs> and prepare themselves for our journey to a new and more beautiful Bahama land. <laughs> Speaker, time will only permit me to touch on a few matters today, but I'm honored to start with the best of the best. On Friday, 29th of September, Ministry of Public Works held its Employee of the Year luncheon at the Hilton. No less than 16 dedicated employees vied for the title. 
The winner was Mr. William Brown, Clerk of Works in the architectural section of the ministry. So speak, I congratulate Mr. Brown for his victory over a world-class field of outstanding professionals. All of the candidates, sir, are people who exemplify exceptional commitment to public service. And I'm thankful that they're all serving in the Ministry of Public Works. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm just a little biased. Well, no. I'm a lot biased. But all of the other ministries need to give up now. <laughs> I'm convinced that the Public Service Employee of the Year will definitely come from the Ministry of Public Works. I can feel it, Mr. Speaker. This is our year. So I ask everyone to remember the name William Brown, a name that we will all get to know when he receives the ultimate honor bestowed by his peers in the public service. <laughs> Speaker, what a great promotion. I now turn to the outstanding work that is being done by the boards that fall under my portfolio. I will not speak to the Water and Sewage Corporation because the chairman sits in this place and is more capable of speaking to his responsibilities. I shall also address the Bridge Authority on another occasion. I'll start with BPL. I've spoken extensively, sir, about the work that is being done by this board. And I take this opportunity once again to thank them for their amazing focus on improving the cooperation and the country. I'm especially pleased at the new procurement policies that they've put in place which makes it difficult for insiders to abuse the process and give confidential information to friends and business associates. Already the process has saved BPL millions of dollars. The speaker, and I want to say this publicly, this process will be put to the test and refined beginning this week as BPL will issue a number of RFPs, requests for proposals. As a speaker, the process will be transparent, and I commend the board for ensuring that everyone will have a fair opportunity and that there will be no secret deals and subverting of the process as there was under the former administration. While I am on the topic of BPL, Mr. Speaker, I should mention that a number of corporate entities have published information with respect to renewable energy projects in the Bahamas. My ministry has consulted with IRCA, which is the independent regulator of the sectors, and we have been advised that IRCA has not approved any large-scale utility solar, pro scale solar projects. We anticipate, sir, that corporate citizens will continue to operate within the parameters of the law. Finally, sir, I wish to apologize to the residents of Inago who suffered through a weekend without power. BPL is working to get your new generator to you from Florida in the shortest possible period of time. And in the interim, we'll continue to do their best to ensure that the old generator holds up so that Inago is not inconvenienced in the manner that they have been. Speaker, I'm advised also advise that as of 4th of October, EPL crews have been executing repairs in Ragged Island. Poles are being planted and lines are now being pulled. EPL is also completing the tensioning and tying off of the lines and intends to energize the lines before the end of this week. So Exuma, Ragged Island, we are working for all of you. Mr. Speaker, I commend industrious employees of BPL who are doing such outstanding work in Ragged Island and Mr. Speaker to recognize the team that is currently working in Anguilla to assist in the restoration efforts there. They are scheduled to return home on October 28 and I'm sure that all Bahamians will join me in praying for their safety as they seek to assist our brothers and sisters in our neighboring Caribbean island. Speaker, I now move on to town planning. 
I get dizzy, sir, looking at page after page of the applications that the Town Planning Board has already dealt with. It was mind-boggling. They're definitely a hard-working board, and I thank them for their service. The new board is chaired by a workaholic named Diane Colavesco Dunkley. They've met many challenges upon assuming officer. Among those challenges were numerous abuses of alleged, alleged abuses of power of the planning process in the past, resulting in physical planning inspectors being called in by government officials to, I quote, rubber stamp applications, even if they are inconsistent with zoning regulations. I've told the new committee that there will be no interference with their work and asked them to report. I've made no, no, Mr. Speaker, I've made, I want to make it clear I've made no specific allegation about the former minister. I've made none. Yeah. But you were in the seat. I've told the new committee that there will be no interference with their work and I asked them to report anyone who seeks to interfere with their work. Secondly, there's been much confusion and disparity with the authority of town planning committees and districts, district councils in the family islands. Has resulted in arbitrary standards from community to community and from island to island. The so Speaker, the new committee will be presenting recommendations to deal with this issue, which can so negatively impact our responses to hurricanes. And I think all of us saw some of those issues in the family islands that we visited. Third, Mr. Speaker, there's understaffing at physical planning inspector level, and that resulted in an application backlog and on personal burnout of some of our people. Fourth, sir, there's understaffing at the enforcement officer level, resulting in an abundance of self-perpetuating breaches of planning control throughout the Bahamas. Finally, sir, I want to touch on the fa fact, failure of the government to appoint a new director when the previous director retired. This is now in the process of being remedied. Mr. Speaker, this new town planning committee is committed to adhering strictly to the provisions of the act and maintaining the integrity of their office. They are in the process of ensuring that the manner in which they conduct their work is transparent and that everyone who is involved in the town planning process is held accountable. They are analyzing the process and will seek to streamline it so that as soon as they eliminate the current backlog, applicants will be able to expect to have their matters resolved within a three-week window. Before I leave this topic, sir, let me advise the public that the Ministry of Public Works intends to begin shortly with prosecutions for breaches of the Building Regulations Act, for people who continue to construct, construct buildings without valid building permits, or construct additions without valid building permits. Fine, but you'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> we also intend, sir, to begin prosecution soon for illegal roadside garages. That's the warning that has come, Mr. Speaker. We need to clear up those garages. We need to start applying properly for building permits because we will start prosecuting. <laughs> Speaker, this town planning committee is composed of amazingly dedicated Bahamian patriots. I have full confidence in the job that they have done. I now turn to the straw market authority. Mr. Speaker, I was fortunate to be blessed by the appointment of a dynamo named Kelly Ingram as chair of the straw market authority. In a short period, this authority has already begun to improve our premier tourist attraction and also focus on ensuring that our beloved straw market and straw vendors are respected for their labor, their work under the most uncomfortable of conditions. Mr. Speaker, upon coming to office, following the following matters required immediate and intense focus. First, fire prevention. On about 22nd of June 2016, a report for repairing and painting of the fire sprinkler system at the Nassau Market on Bay Street was prepared by the then Ministry of Works and Urban Development. Further, on the 27th of July 2016, the Royal Bahamas Police Force Fire Prevention Section 
issued a report on the Bay Street straw market. This report set out a number of issues and concerns regarding the state of the fire alarm system and fire protocols at the Bay Street market. The ministry's report set out certain maintenance works that should be undertaken on the fire sprinkler system at the Bay Street market. The board, to its dismay, discovered that no recommendation set forth neither the ministry's report or the fire police report had been complied with. I have since had technical officers from my ministry assess the fire sprinkler system, and we are in the process of tendering the works so as to undertake the required maintenance work. Speaker, the lack of problem maintenance of the fire sprinkler system and non-existence of any fire prevention protocol at the Bay Street Market, coupled with the lack of any form of building insurance, fire or otherwise, leaves the Straw Market Authority exposed to untold liability. The issue of fire prevention is of utmost importance to the board, and the board intends to take every precaution necessary to ensure the safety of our vendors and the people who are visiting the market. Two, Mr. Speaker, there's an urgent need for a CEO, a manager, who is charged with the daily responsibility of the Straw Market Authority. Former Chairman, Mr. Simmons, also acted in the capacity of CEO and manager. It's been determined that the combining of the positions of Chairman and CEO, manager, of the Straw Market Authority is a practice which should not continue. And accordingly, the board is undertaking <coughs> efforts to engage a CEO manager of the Straw Market Authority. Third, finances. The Accounts Department of the Straw Market Authority lacks the procedural policies necessary to prevent the mismanagement and mishandling of funds of the Straw Market Authority. An audit of the finances of the authority is urgently required. The incomplete audits for 2013 2014 and 2015 makes it difficult to commence the process for an audit for 2016 and 17. Straw Market Authority has failed to comply with the provisions of the Straw Market Authority Act 2011, Section 12, with respect to audits and accounts for five years. <coughs> Straw Market Authority has failed to keep proper accounts of all transactions and other records in relation to the statutory obligation to do so. In particular, sir, <coughs> copies and original contracts for the provision of services have not been located. Due diligence information on service providers has not been obtained. In particular, there exists no copies of business license, tax compliance certificate, NIB compliance confirmation, or confirmation of beneficial ownership for any service provider. Straw Market Authority has two credit cards issued from the Royal Bank of Canada. The Accounts Department was unable to provide an accounting or produce invoices for personal payments received in relation to those two credit cards, which has been left with large, large outstanding balances. Wow. Each, <laughs> each member of the previous Board of Directors of the Straw Market Authority was provided with a cell phone and all charges were absorbed by the authority. To date, the board has not provided, been provided with any information that suggests that any former board member was made personally liable for any cell phone charges. <coughs> no former board member has returned any cellular device purchased by the Straw Market Authority. Combined balance on the cell phones is $33,649.18. Finally, Mr. Board. Speaker. Straw Market Authority ran a daycare facility at a cost of $25 per week per child. The board has not been provided with any accounting records regarding the collection of the fees from the daycare. Straw Market Authority has failed to have produced annual audited financial statements, and the minister responsible for the Straw Market Authority has unfortunately never been in a position to lay copies of the audited financial statements or an annual report before the House of Assembly, as specifically required by Section 13 of the Act. The Straw Market Authority's Depart Accounts Department has no set written policy for the collection of outstanding stall rents or procedure regarding temporary and permanent closure of stalls, revocation of licenses. Straw Market Authority Accounts Department 
has confirmed that its former directors of Straw Market Authority paid themselves Christmas bonus for the years ending 31st December 2015 and 16. 2015 bonus was a total of $7,650.02 was paid to the board members during March 2016. 2016 bonus was a total of $7,233.35 and was paid on about 8 December 2016. There's no authority in the act for the payment of such bonuses. Mr. Speaker, there is some good news, however. Vendors are pleased to note that the board is currently viewing the penalty of $50 for hawkers and upon obtaining legal advice, will be seeking to increase the fine associated with this vexing problem facing straw vendors as well as working with the police to enforce this illegal practice. Mr. Speaker, I am thankful that Ms. Ingram and her board members have so much energy. They are working in the best interest of our vendors and will continue to make a tangible difference. Speaker, as I think of our young people at BPL who are vibrantly given service to the hurricane ravaged island of Ant Anguilla, I give thanks to give thanks to Almighty that our beautiful Bahama land was spared the rages of Maria. We got only a touch of Irma, sir, and all of us saw the damage and the pain suffered by Bahamians in Salina Point, Acklands and Ragged Island. I'm thankful, sir, for the Prime Minister's vision that Ragged Island will now become our first truly green island. And we at the Ministry of Works We at the Ministry of Works look forward to meeting this challenge in a manner which will improve the lives of our people. Mr. Speaker, you also embrace the challenge of amending the building codes in yes. accordance with the Prime Minister's mandate so as to reflect the very real need with respect to the erection of buildings on our coastline. Mr. Speaker, many of our family island communities are traditional fishing villages. It is our duty to support the right of our citizens to remain in their ancestral homes. But at the same time, sir, we must ensure that buildings meet modern safety and infrastructural needs. I see, sir, just demand that we build higher, and strong winds require that the inspection process in the construction phase is strengthened. The speaker, following provisions, which are minimum requirements, are outlined in existing Bahamas building codes. First, with respect to flooding, Section 3021 requires that one is to construct the main floor finish level at a height of 12 feet above the new floodplain, the known floodplain. Secondly, with respect to surges, code provides that the coastal zone is considered to be within 1,500 feet inland from the main high water level or the entire island, whichever is less. With respect to hurricane force winds, the code mandates that wind design is to be in accordance with the American Society of Civil Engineers table, where the maximum design is for 150 mile per hour winds in coastal areas, which is equivalent to a category three hurricanes. It is to be noted, sir, that that ASC requ requirement designed for 155, 150 mile per hour winds is for three second gusts and is not equivalent to 150 miles per hour on the Safa Simpson scale. Nevertheless, sir, the above three major elements of the code do have several shortcomings. First, there are few available records of any known flood levels or <coughs> storm surges throughout the Bahamas. There's a need to introduce zonal mapping of areas affected by storm surge so as to create no-build zones throughout the islands of the Bahamas. Some of us may be concerned about how this development will affect some <coughs> traditional communities, sir. But in our quest for safety, we must choose to protect life first and foremost, and we must consult with those communities. But we have to protect the lives of our people. Secondly, there's also a need to control the construction types in potential surge zones. 
that is, elevated floors on concrete piles. Also, the construction of the main structural frame, frame and timber should be restricted and controlled, as the failures witnessed in Ragged Island recently were partly due to non-compliance to the building codes. In this respect, the Ministry of Public Works will either have to expand to every family island, or we shall have to increase the effectiveness of local government in each community. Third, Mr. Speaker, there's no reference to flood design in the code. There needs to be additional references for flood design. And fourth, sir, wind speed is based on wind speed maps for the U.S., the closest region being the Florida Keys, as there's no wind speed map available for the Bahamas. There is a need for the compilation and charting of a wind speed map for the islands of the Bahamas with the assistance of the Bahamas Meteorological Offices, and you would know something about that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, all of the above improvements need to be done in conjunction with both the Professional Architects Board and Professional Engineers Board, and with consultation of our communities. Speaker, the Buildings Control Division has now initiated <coughs> procedures for the review of the current code's third edition with the view of either a revision of it or amendments, with special emphasis on incorporating two additional components to improve the country's environmental sustainability and mitigation against the effects of climate change, particularly recurrent damage due to hurricanes and improve energy efficiency in buildings and renewable energy. The speaker pro proposed revisions to the building code it was also address one, sustainability including lifetime cycles of buildings. Two, thermal insulation in buildings. Three, renewable energy, solar, hydro, wind, biodiesel. Four, climate change. We have to design, so we have to design for flooding from sea level rise. We have to consider that there will be stronger and more frequent hurricanes. And we have to address the increased cost of construction that may result from mitigating the efforts of greater storm surges. Residents of Marshall Road know exactly what I'm speaking of. Speaker, five, coastal design will be important. Six, collection and storage of water, as they do in many Caribbean countries. And finally, sir, we must review and suggest the necessary policies and incentives that would support the sustainable development of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, these are all critical steps that every Bahamian must buy into and support if we really love our Bahama land as much as we say we do. Mr. Speaker, today is the most appropriate time for me to touch on another challenge that my ministry faces, and that is summer school repairs. Every summer, sir, the Ministry of Public Works has a responsibility to prepare, prepare scopes of work for repairing our schools, and then to negotiate contracts and to supervise the work. This year, sir, there was a most ambitious repair agenda. Despite the claims of enormous expenditure on schools over the past few years. We have met schools this year in the worst condition that I've ever seen them in. It is clear that many of the repairs in recent years were wholly inadequate, and we need to face that and address it, Mr. Speaker. I therefore commend our officers who took a first stab at this enormous project. When, it's, when all is told, a little over $8 million will have been spent. But in the coming years, we will require an even more comprehensive focus. Our talented professionals at the Ministry of Public Works have performed extremely well in difficult circumstances, even though all of the results have not been to our liking. Mr. Speaker, I was taught that the leader must take responsibility when everything does not go according to plan. As the Minister of Public Works, I take full responsibility for the delays that we have experienced this summer. 
some of our summer repairs will now have to become Christmas repairs. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we can do better, and we will do better. <laughs> Speaker, I want to touch a little bit on staffing at the Ministry of Public Works. Mr. Speaker, this discussion provides me that wonderful opportunity to speak directly to Bahamian professionals, young Bahamian professionals. And so I say to them, if you are an engineer, if you are an architect, if you are a quantity surveyor, the Ministry of Public Works offers you a challenging and fulfilling career and wonderful opportunities. And I want you, <laughs> Speaker, Speaker, I am absolutely horrified and flabbergasted to see the salaries that we pay to engineers, architects, and foreign needs surveyors. These are professionals who are in extremely high demand. In the private sector, they are remunerated at the highest levels. However, in the public service, their salaries do not reflect their skills, their expertise, or the, the demand for their service. Speaker, public service will not be able to match the salaries in the private sector. And likewise, they will not be able to match some of our benefits and the pension that we can offer. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say today that I am armed and I'm ready to fight for better remuneration for our professionals. Mm -hmm. And at the Ministry of Public Works, I can assure you that I am going to be vigorously recruiting Bahamian professionals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you permit me, Mr. Speaker, to put out my want ads, right <laughs> now I'm looking for two senior architects. Yeah. I'm also looking for two architects and four assistant architects. So, Mr. Speaker, two senior architects, two architects, and four assistant architects. So, Mr. Speaker, come home, come home. Come home, that's right. So, Mr. Speaker, for any architects who have the qualifications to fit into any of these positions and who have a vision for a better future for our Bahamas. I likewise invite you to join our team. <laughs> Speaker, I need three senior engineers. I need seven engineers. And I need six assistant engineers. Let me say that again. I need three senior engineers. I need seven engineers. I need six assistant engineers. I shall be aggressively pursuing qualified young Bahamians because I want them at the Ministry of Public Works. Yes. Sweet music. You're building the new Bahamas. <laughs> I am looking, Mr. Speaker, for engineers who have the skills, the vision, and determination to rebuild our beautiful Bahama land, or as the Prime Minister says, a new Bahamas. Yes. Speaker, I also need quantity surveyors and assistant quantity surveyors. And over the next few months, sir, I will, as I have been, seek personal commitments from our professionals in these areas to come to work at the Ministry of Public Works. I have a few commitments already, Mr. Speaker, but I want more. I would wish, sir, for the word to go out, Bahamian engineers, Bahamian architects, Bahamian quantity surveyors, that they are welcome and they are needed at the Ministry of Public Works, and that they have a minister who wants them there. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, anyone who wishes to take advantage of this opportunity can email me personally. Thomas Desmond Bannister yes. at bahamas.gov.bs. <laughs> South Andrews, I know you know some people. 
So tell them, tell them, come home. Speaker. You could come home too. <laughs> so speaker, I also need inspectors. Because I'm going to talk, I'm talking about the prosecutions I'm going to be doing. We're going to need inspectors also. I need master plumbers and other professionals who are prepared to step up to the challenge. So Mr. Speaker, I'm publicly sending out the challenge to our professionals. If you have the qualifications and the skill set, the Ministry of Works wants you. Sir, I need all of those professionals yesterday. Speaker, <laughs> Ministry, Ministry of Works works everywhere in this country. Everywhere. Everywhere, Naughty Luther. Speaker, I want to speak on something that's very important and personal to me, and that is mentorship. Speaking about these employment opportunities permits me to touch on an exciting initiative that the ministry will commence next year. Speaker, I want young Bahamians who are currently studying engineering, architecture, and allied careers to apply to the Ministry of Public Works to work with us during the summer. We will commence a true professional mentorship initiative. We will attach these college students to professionals in the ministry during the summertime. And those professionals will be encouraged to maintain contact with their mentee during the school year so as to encourage them in their educational development. We will be aware, aware of when they are scheduled to graduate and will seek to fast track their applications if my friend in the public service will help me with that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Public Works offers the most challenging career opportunities to young people yes, it does. who have the right stuff. And I want our young professionals to know that we want them and that at the Ministry of Public Works, they will be involved in the most challenging work in the country. I expect, sir, that shortly I will unveil a very special in-house training initiative also. Speaker, I now turn to two concerns that I share with tens of thousands of Bahamians. Street signs and potholes. Oh, please. <laughs> Speaker, in Carmichael and in many of our other communities, street signs have virtually disappeared. As the Minister with Responsibility for Street Science, Speaker, this is deeply troubling. Our society cannot drop to a degree of incivility where street signs are routinely stolen for their metal content and there are no consequences. The Ministry of Public Works will shortly begin an intense initiative to replace stolen street signs and the straightened damaged and bent poles. At this time, I ask responsible members of our public to be on the lookout for these thieves who can cause accidents and also negatively impact response time for the police or emergency service by their callous <clears throat> and dishonest acts. By the same token, sir, I ask my fellow Bahamians to be careful in traversing the streets. Too many street sign posts and light poles are being knocked down by careless drivers. And I get particularly vexed when I go on the airport gateway. Oh, yeah. I urge Bahamians, when they see these incidents, take photographs of them and to email those photos to the responsible authorities so that we can collect the cost of those poles and those careless drivers. Okay. Otherwise, our taxes will be used to pay for these signs and poles over and over again. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, at some stage, at yes, at some stage, the, right, the Honorable Prime Minister will speak about this also. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, I want members opposite to, to understand and believe that I'm not a hater. <laughs> you're a, you're a, he, he, he's a lover. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, I don't hate anyone. But I have one hatred 
I have one hatred I have to confess, that every member of this honorable house, I'm sure, and I dare say every Bahamian shares with me. Speaker, I hate potholes. Yes. I hate potholes with a passion. Yes. They burst my tires. Yes. They messed up my rims. Yes. They set my hubcaps fl flying. Yes. Speaker, I'm not ashamed to admit that I hate potholes. <laughs> hurt your false teeth. Speaker, <laughs> in public life, we are judged by how efficiently we deal with the small vexations that impact the daily lives of our citizens. Yes. Bahamians complain about potholes, and they complain that we have not been as responsive as we should. Speak, I want every Bahamian, I want every Bahamian, every member of parliament, to write down the number 302 302-9700. 302-9700 is the hotline for the Ministry of Public Works. I've heard the constant complaint, sir. I've heard the constant complaint about the fact that the hotline has not been manned as effectively as it should. Speaker, that has to, and that will change. I expect that Bahamians will get courteous and quick responses from the hotline. And I will not offer any excuses, Mr. Speaker. If anyone does not receive a quick and courteous response when they call the hotline, I ask them to send a text, not to call, send a text or send a WhatsApp to 814-2190. 814-2190, specifying the date and the time of their call to the hotline and the issue that has not been addressed. We will be responsive in the Ministry of Public Works to citizen concerns, and we are going to be transparent in what we do. So, Mr. Speaker, I keep reminding myself that I have two brothers who are pilots, and both of them constantly remind me of the importance of redundancies. And I hope that reliance on that redundancy by having to use that second number will never be necessary. But in the fight to control potholes, I will use every single weapon that I can find. Mr. Speaker, I will close today by touching on a critical new unit in my ministry, the National Recovery and Reconstruction Unit. Mr. Speaker, Obviously, my prime minister didn't believe I had enough work to do. <laughs> and so, effective on the 1st of September 2017, he included the NRRU in my portfolio. I must have wondered what was wrong with me when I thanked him. <laughs> you didn't hate him. <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, I thrive on challenges. NRRU has been an unruly horse which we will tame in the best interest of the Bahamian people. Yes. yes. <laughs> One day soon, sir, I will communicate to this honorable house the findings of the accountants in relation to NRRU. But for day, today, Mr. Speaker, I will stay upbeat. Mr. Speaker, this government... Yeah, I said it before. They want to see the National Recovery and Reconstruction Unit. Mr. Speaker, the government is unwavering in its commitment to the Bahamian people. This commitment, sir, is evidenced by its demonstration of transparency and accountability, in fiscal prudence, and in its pledge to afford the qualities of high priority in our governance. In keeping with this commitment, and as is promised in the previous communication, I wish to provide some insight into the operations and function of the National Recovery and Reconstruction Unit, which was located in the office of the Prime Minister under the previous administration. Speaker, that unit was created in October 2015 in the aftermath of the passage of Hurricane Joe Kidd. 
Oh. I like to say joking. Joking? Because <laughs> they wasn't joking. They was joking. Walk in. Walk, walk in. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't joking. It's creation. That was, that was Glenn the last time. It's creation was... Christy, I think it was. It's creation was intended to strengthen capacity in national recovery efforts. Uh, we have damage assessments and reconstruction. <clears throat> Speaker, I'm advised that the work of the NRRU was winding down towards the end of 2016. However, due to the passage of Hurricane Matthew, which caused significant damage in the highly populated islands of New Providence, Grand Bahama, and Andros, the operations of the NRRU were reactivated in high gear. Speaker, this unit was actually created as an extension of the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA. And its objective at the time was to permit NEMA to concentrate its efforts on its mandate, which was to prepare Bahamians for threatening weather systems and to execute its duties consistent with the provisions of the Disaster Act. While on the face of it, sir, these activities appear laudable, one of the predominant challenges resulting from the operation of this unit was that it was performing a number of fu functions that NEMO was legally mandated to do. In actuality, sir, well, the unit had several extremely capable professionals. It was also staffed with some individuals who had little, if any, expertise in the areas in which they were assigned to perform. The scenario is further compounded by the fact that NEMO, the duly constituted authority, with expertly trained and experienced staff, had no administrative or supervisory oversight with the day-to-day -day operations of the unit, other than the supervision of its work groups. It is noteworthy, Mr. Speaker, that this agency was given oversight of work for which they themselves should have been supervised and monitored. And I will give clear examples of this as I delve further into the unit's operations. It is also noteworthy that the NRRU was set up without due consideration the several key areas of its operations, and accordingly, the unit was challenged in a number of ways. I wish to draw attention of honorable members to the functions which NRRU was mandated to perform, and they were, one, to provide overall leadership as a coordinating agency to effect repairs to hurricane damage and destroyed homes, two, to conduct technical assessments in the affected islands, Three, to prepare scopes of works for repairs to government buildings. Four, to prepare lists of materials required for home repairs in affected islands. Five, to seek competitive, competitive, competitive pricing for purchase of building materials from various suppliers, both in New Providence and the Family Islands. Six, to prepare distribution lists for persons eligible to receive material repairs, materials to repair their homes. Seven, to identify contractors to construct and repair damaged homes. Eight, to provide due diligence with social services and NEMO for persons who qualify for new homes. Speaker, since the beginning of its operations, the NRRU constructed five homes in Crooked Island, three in Auckland, four in San Salvador, and 12 in Long Island. Another noteworthy function of the unit was that they oversaw home repairs using NEMA's work groups, their supplies and their materials. However, a quarter of the way through the process, the repair and construction of new homes by NEMA's work groups was turned over to the Depart Department of Housing. Speaker, I will touch on a few of the challenges following the formation of NRRU. First, the unit was formed without a proper administrative structure, coupled with the fact that it did not have key administrative personnel assigned. One would think that a finance officer or financial controller would be assigned to the unit, given the financial implications for the disbursement of huge amounts of money, totaling millions of dollars, and its attendant duties. However, all financial transactions were managed by the Ministry of Finance. Angliston, you could be assured I can be fair. I can be totally fair in what I say. Totally, totally. Transactions were managed by the Ministry of Finance and not the NRRU. Secondly, the political director with responsible for N responsibility for NRRU failed to follow the advice of the Department of Public Works. The strategies that were offered to expedite the cleanup process 
with minimizing costs, administrative burden, excuse me, and effectiveness to <coughs> minimize costs, effect, administrative burden, and improve effectiveness were not accepted. There was no alternative strategy nor strategic vision. Third, the promised supervisory staff never materialized. Accordingly, there was no mechanism in place to deal with inflated and fraudulent invoices, of which there were many. The speaker, it is instructive to, instructive to note that both NEMA and NRRU operated from first an administrative account, which is managed by NEMA, a donation account managed by the Ministry of Finance, and an impressed account managed by the Ministry of Finance for both New Providence and Grand Bahama. And as I said, I have in hand reports that I will come to at, a, at another stage. Moreover, there were challenges in the human resources operations, which were managed and controlled by the office of the Prime Minister. The appointment of a human resources officer would have certainly ensured the proper and timely engagement of staff in both administration and construction. With this in mind, Mr. Speaker, colleagues would not be surprised to learn that at no time was the unit adequately staffed with the technical officers required to accomplish its goals. It is fundamental, sir, that central to the success of a program with a technical thrust, there must be a complement of competent technical officers. Mr. Speaker, during the recovery efforts following Hurricane Matthew, attempts by the unit to engage several persons failed, and the fact that the few technical officers engaged were not paid in time presented another issue. So the situation was further compounded when technical assessments were hampered due to the unavailability of vehicles for the technical team to carry out its assessments in New Providence and Grand Bahama. Cars had to be rented in order to complete assessments. Speak additionally, for many years it has been the practice of successive governors to assist Bahamians whose homes were slightly or severely damaged or destroyed during hurricanes. Senior public officers from the Department of Social Services and the Ministry of Public Works devised criteria for persons to receive assistance. Following the passage of Hurricane Matthew, NEMA, Social Services, and NRU established the criteria for government assistance. Persons applying for this assistance were placed in one of three categories. First category, new construction of totally destroyed homes and those beyond repair. Secondly, materials and labor for qualified homeless, homeowners. And third, materials only for qualified homeowners. Speaker, the work of the unit was organized such that the 23 constituencies in New Providence were divided between eight zones. Each zone was assigned a coordinator who had responsibility for the supervision of the assessment process and determining the homeowner's eligible status and the requisite follow-up regarding the status of contracts for house repairs. Speaker, once the eligibility requirement for consideration was met by the homeowner, a contractor was supposed to be selected and a letter of intent prepared. The process ultimately culminated with the issuance of a purchase order for materials and a check for the mobilization payment of 20% of the total contract sum. Speak, honorable members would wish to be advised that to date, the number of homeowners in New Providence approved for vouchers for materials total 641 and a dollar value of $837,000. Speaker, I'm advised that as of the 28th of April this year, there's 1,633 letters of intent issued in New Providence, 579 of which remain for conversion to contracts, and 7, 579 of which remains for conversion to contracts. Excuse me. 1,054 of these letters of intents have had contracts prepared for total labor costs of $6,408,399. At six million four hundred eight thousand three hundred ninety-nine dollars and one cent. The speaker, three hundred and forty-nine of these contracts have been certified as completed. Wow. Cumulatively, there were three thousand four hundred and fifty-two assessments conducted for homeowners, 
of which 178 were deemed ineligible. Speaker, I would be remiss, however, if I did not refer to the implementation of a new policy in October 2016, which extended repairs by NEMA and NRU beyond roof repairs. The policy read in part, and I quote, in an effort to provide maximum assistance to persons impacted by natural disasters, the government of the Bahamas would expand its housing repair from roof repair only to include ceilings, floors, partitions, windows, doors, plumbing, and other electrical repairs. Mr. Speaker, seemingly as a result of this policy, some persons receive materials which range from $200 to a contract inclusive of labor and materials valued up to $68,000 per family. Speaker, the construction of new homes has not been without its challenges. For example, a number of the homes that were to be constructed in Andros and Grand Bahama total 25 and 80 respectively. If the government of the Bahamas were to construct these 105 homes, it would take an inordinate amount of time, even with the assistance of the private sector. Speaker, the government is simply not in a position to do so. The financial reality, Mr. Speaker, is that the Bahamas is not in a position to bear the burden of new construction at this time due to its existing financial and economic conditions. Mr. Speaker, we are patently aware that having regard to the current circumstances, it is virtually impossible and unsustainable to continue with existing policies and practices with regard to home repairs and reconstruction. Therefore, the government has decided to appropriate a fund totaling $10 million, which will be budgeted for repairs with respect to hurricane relief. <coughs> Speaker, we are, since we are undoubtedly a government of openness and transparency, we shall ensure that every cent is accounted for and that nothing is wasted. In this respect, Mr. Speaker, I must express my concern that the former administration entered into a seven-year agreement the lease depends build a square compound at a monthly rent of $46,892.40. What? Which totaled five. Say that again. $46,892.40 a month. The totals. $562,708.80 a year. This was not a prudent decision. On top of that, the government had to pay a security deposit, which is generally unknown in the government's work. The government of the Bahamas had to pay a security deposit of $43,620.84, as well as the first and last month's rent. Oh. <laughs> Speaker, I can't imagine the government entering into this type of agreement. Sadly, this lease is, this lease is for seven years and there does not appear to be a way out of it. Mr. Speaker, we are aware that a number of claims for assistance reportedly remain outstanding, as well as houses still being in disrepair following the passage of Hurricane Matthew. And two, a report on expenditure for that $150 million borrowed by the government remains necessary. The people who know where and how their money is spent. Mr. Speaker, it's irrefutable that the functioning of the NRRU has to undergo change, particularly as it relates to ensuring that those persons who are truly in need are the beneficiary of the assistance that it provides. To the extent possible, sir, we want to prevent the likelihood of mismanagement and abuse that heretofore existed in order to bring normalcy, transparency, and accountability to this process. Speaker, we have a moral obligation to ensure that the decisions we make in the short term have long-term benefits for the welfare and the well-being of Bahamians. We must seek to align those functions necessary to the program requirements of NRRU. And in doing so, sir, I am pleased to report that we are seeking to put in place the necessary mechanisms to provide assistance for those who are truly in need. Speaker, permit me please to suggest to our people that it is critical that we protect our largest investment, which is our home. Mm -hmm. By purchasing appropriate amounts of insurance, since we live in a hurricane zone, and we are subject to all manners of climate change. Exuma, I know you like that. 
your insurance business. <laughs> and we are subject to all my, I'm, you don't have to pay me for the commercial. And we live in a hurricane zone, and we are subject to all manners of climate change. We all have some responsibility. For our circumstances, Mr. Speaker, this will no doubt ensure public assistance at the expense of Bahamian taxpayers be provided to only those who are truly in need. Mr. Speaker, one of the predominant cha changes will involve an audit exercise of the Grand Bahama operations with appropriate recommendations. We will also request an audit of all expenditure by NRRU prior to August 2017. Mr. Speaker, we will insist that an external account accounting firm provide monthly financial reports in keeping with the requirements of the Auditor General's Department. I wish, sir, with regards to say that with regards to transforming the operations of the NRRU, I'm pleased to inform that the unit has been transferred to the Ministry of Public Works. However, however because of the matters that I've raised, it will remain in its current location. I will also seek to facilitate the requested collaboration with my ministerial colleague, the Minister of Finance, to ensure that the accounting requisite accounting controls are in place and to make payouts of hurricane relief assistance to those eligible homeowners who have already commenced under the previous administration. Mr. Speaker, my time is running out, so I'm going to touch on some of these matters later. I close by saying that we are fully aware that we are caretakers of the people's resources. We recognize that the people feel a sense of betrayal and disloyalty by the actions and missteps of the side opposite. But we intend to fix it, and fix it we will, by demonstrating our care and commitment to their cause. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's the people's time, and people deserve no less. I have 15 seconds. To speak, I close, <laughs> I close by offering my sincere thanks to Dame Marguerite. And in this respect, I am joined by my father, Horatio David Bannister, who gave exemplary service in South Andrews for many years. I wish him be a belated happy birthday. And I pray that one day I can be half the man he is. So, Mr. Speaker, Carmichael, Carmichael. <laughs> supports this resolution. May Almighty God bless our Governor General. May Almighty God bless our beautiful Bahamala. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Chair is, is familiar with a constituency I can benefit from some of your announcements. <laughs> there are some parliamentary traditions that are very important and that we uh, in the Bahamas have not followed for many years, and that is that the speaker ought to, the speaker is a vulnerable position in every parliament, and Ministers ought to look out for the speaker's constituency. Yeah. That is very important. I know that the prime minister is concerned about that, and I know that all ministers are concerned that the speaker's yeah. constituency will get the kind of assistance that is needed. Thank you. As many, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Sanans rise very briefly because it would be remiss of me to not stand on an occasion such as this to thank the Governor General for her speech from the throne. She certainly did an excellent job sitting in the square reading the speech from the throne, something that Her Excellency does very well and she fulfills her, t her job with great degree of splendor and dedication to all people of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. We wish her well, and we wish to, she continues to serve the people 
that she loves dearly. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm only going to talk for a few minutes. The, I'm very grateful to the people for St. Anne's, to, and by extension some of them in Montague, for electing me for the third non-consecutive term. <laughs> <laughs> Easter Village Road, whichever you want to call it. Um, and I, I'm grateful for them for that, and I continue to serve them every day that I'm in this place, and also when I'm not here. Mr. Speaker, I'm also grateful for this to the Prime Minister, the member for Killarney, for having allowed me to serve again in the Cabinet of the Bahamas with the, cons with the uh, ministry that I have, which is not by accident that it included financial services was linked with immigration. Many of you have heard my comments recently through on the question of financial services. The industry is our second pillar of our economy, and it definitely needs assistance. It needs help. It needs a lot of things, as with the wider part of the economy. One of the issues that I think we hope to look forward to in this coming session is the liberalization of the Bahamas so we can fight the challenges of the modern day economy here in the Bahamas and around the world. I am only going to say that because the speaker after me has some interesting things to say, some of which touch on my portfolio. And as a member of his cabinet, I serve at his pleasure and at his behest. Mr. Speaker, the issue, <laughs> the issue of immigration, though, I will, is contained in very succinct parts of our law. The Constitution, the Bahamas Nationality Act, and the Immigration Act. And it deals with persons who are entitled to citizenship, which you've heard me say is a very it, uh, topical issue, which we have to put in the forefront for discussion. And it also deals with the issue of who is legally entitled to be in the Bahamas. Those are two very distinct issues. And it, I think now, as the minister, as the member for Carmichael talked about his work at the Ministry of Works, this is my second time at immigration, and it gives me goosebumps and excitement because we are finally going to do something about immigration in the Commonwealth. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in so doing and in so saying, it will be done humanely, passionately, efficiently, and within the ambit of the Constitution and the law of the Bahamas. It is high time we deal with this problem. All of us have been touched by it. We have family members that have been touched by it. We have school friends. We have any number of constituents, any number of persons that have been touched by the fact, whether it's not being able to get a bank, a bank account, not being able to get a national insurance card, not being able to get their spousal permit, not being able to be registered as a citizen of the Bahamas having been born here. We all know the ambit. For too long, we, Mr. Speaker, we have swept it under the carpet. Now is the time that it will be dealt with, and I said dealt with fairly, humanely, and within the Constitution of the Bahamas. We will not kick the can down the road. Stay tuned. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, with those few words, more to come. With those few words, Mr. Speaker, I rise to thank the go Governor General her honorable speech, her great degree of dignity in which she delivered it, and may God continue to bless her. Thank you. As many? The, the, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, as I stand here watching the 
members opposite is as if it's, it's as if it's deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> I only, I only want to say, your election coming up soon, I want to say to the member of the Cat Island, I have a PhD in the problems you're going through. <laughs> and, you, you and therefore, and therefore <laughs> if you want to know what to do, Consult me. <laughs> <laughs> the member for the member for Angliston. If you want to know what not to do, consult me. <laughs> I'm available. For consultation. My doors are open. <laughs> the speaker, allow me to thank the constituency of Galani for giving me this opportunity to speak here this evening. I also want to thank my colleagues who has done a remarkable job and has spoken so eloquently and graciously about this resolution in thanking the Governor General. I want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, as I rise, I am pleased to give my support to the resolution to thank Her Excellency, the Governor General, Dame Marguerite Pinling, for graciously reading, reading the speech from the throne at the opening of this new term of this ancient parliament. To paraphrase one of my predecessors, I quote, we are in Her Excellency's debt. Her posture and those of her predecessors in office have demonstrated the importance of the office of the Governor General being above the political fray. End quote. In the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, executive authority is vested in the Governor General. The Constitution also mandates that the government of the day keeps Her Excellency informed about what her government, her government is doing. This is a mandate that I intend to honor. With her permission and at her convenience, I plan to deepen the long-standing convention by which a Prime Minister regularly calls on the Governor General to discuss matters of the state. This commitment, Mr. Speaker, is a part of my government's program of government and political reform. We must continue <coughs> to perfect and deepen our constitutional and parliamentary democracy, which enshrines ancient traditions, both necessary and relevant in the 21st century. Mr. Speaker, a primary responsibility of the Prime Minister is the oversight and coordination of the Cabinet and to ensure that the government's policies and programs are being carried out. Accordingly, each government ministry will be asked to develop a multi-year plan with clear annual met metrics for that ministry and in keeping with available finances and resources. These plans will be developed by senior staff and technical officers in each ministry in accord with my government's manifesto commitments and related objectives. 
These plans, Mr. Speaker, will be developed with reference to the National Development Plan. My ministers will be held accountable for these plans. In order to provide greater oversight of ministers, I have pledged not to have a substantive ministry. There are, of course, a number of items, including disaster preparedness, which remains in the portfolio of the Prime Minister. I will meet with each minister individually on a quarterly basis to assess the work of his or her ministry and to help improve the effectiveness of each ministry in carrying out the government's policies. Both Grand Bahama and Abaco have sub-offices of the Office of the Prime Minister. And sub-offices will also be opened in Elutra, Exuma, and Andres. Press Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh Creek Andres. Oh, you're behind. <laughs> to connect the central government to these major islands, I plan to visit each of these offices on a regular basis. This will also improve the effectiveness of government. I have already visited the offices of Abaco and Grand Bahama. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as noted in the speech from the throne and in other communications, my government has embarked on a program of reform and transformation. Such reform requires a long-term vision and concrete steps for change. Such change will not happen overnight. I repeat, such change will not happen overnight. But we are laying the groundwork for change in areas ranging from combating official corruption to bringing local government to new providence to dealing effectively with the new providence landfill to the expansion of the use of solar and renewable energy. We will continue the important work of ongoing reform in the public sector. We will establish a more independent constituencies commission. We will ensure that government is more accountable. We will introduce the Ombudsman Bill 2017 to help make government more responsive to citizens. We are introducing new and revised legislation to combat official corruption. This includes an Integrity Commission Bill, a more advanced anti-corruption corruption bill, inclusive of asset confiscation and public disclosure. <laughs> what this means, Mr. Speaker, if you cannot prove legitimately how you've obtained such wealth, then all will be confiscated and given back to the state. We have already tabled legislation to provide for a standalone office of public prosecution. We will ensure the appointment of honest and fair-minded individuals to the various offices and agencies which combat official corruption. This is essential, Mr. Speaker, if we are to stem public corruption at every level. My government will continue with forensic audits 
in order to identify wrongdoing and to stop such practices in the future. Be assured, be assured that once uncovered, position, status, politics, or family name will not prevent prosecution. We cannot simply ignore the massive abuse and theft of public funds as some in the opposition seem minded to do. The Bahamian people elected this government to vigorously address the culture of corruption, which was a way of life for many in the PLP. We will continue to fulfill this mandate. I read an article recently that stated, and I quote, you have the best rules, the best anti-corruption agency, but if your politicians are corrupt, nothing is going to save the system, yep. end quote. Political will is needed in order to address and stem this scourge. This government and this prime minister have the will to confront <coughs> corruption. We will, Mr. Speaker, promote law and order. And Mr. Speaker, my government's comprehensive vision for, for a 21st century Bahamas includes one, economic development, transformation, and diversification. Two, bolstering national security, including combating crime and its causes, as well as illegal migration. Three, advancing democracy, good governance and freedom through government and political reform. Four, social development, inclusive of education, health care, housing, child, youth, and community development, and other elements of social well-being. Five, promoting and protecting our cultural heritage. Six, environmental stewardship and protection. And seven, protecting and promoting Bahamian interests abroad. We have a comprehensive vision for national development. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas delegation to the hurricane-stricken Dominica returned home last week. We were all shocked to witness firsthand the devastation in our sister country. It appears that a relatively small number of students from Dominica will come to the Bahamas as a part of our educational assistant effort. And I was advised that there may be only be as many as five, if that many, students who will come to the Bahamas as they have made contact. These students will attend private institutions with most attending church-operated schools. And I again thank the church, church community for their generosity of spirit and heart. Because of the urgent need for emergency medical assistance, the Minister of Health will send a team of doctors to Dominica for a specific duration of time to be decided. This is necessary to save lives and to prevent a humanitarian and health care disaster which will compound the disaster brought by Hurricane Maria. The HMBS Lawrence Major will soon embark on a historic mercy mission of a Royal Bahamas Defense Force Marine vessel to a CARICOM sister state. The HMBS Lawrence Major will first visit Jamaica to take on relief supplies being donated 
by Jamaica to Dominica. As the House will be aware, Bahamian Marines previously served in a mission to Haiti under the auspices of the United Nations. Mr. Speaker, one of the scenes we witnessed in Dominica, one of the scenes we witnessed in Dominica was a cross standing on the steeple of a church that was reaching to the heavens. Many around this cross was destroyed, but the cross stood, stood out pointing towards the heavens. So I hope you all have gone. <laughs> <laughs> that cross was a symbol of hope. It is a reminder <laughs> that we should be people of hope. And where there is life, <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> I am proud of the overwhelming support of the Bahamian people to the effort to help bring relief to those in Dominica who have lost everything. I believe that God will richly bless us that the people of the Bahamas offered hope and help to our neighbor in their time of trial. It is sad that some members of the opposition are more concerned with their narrow political interests instead of national interests, the national interests of the Bahamas and the suffering of our neighbors. Mr. Speaker, you are right. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as a part of our effort to reform and stabilize public finances, this is a government committed to financial prudence and good management. The former administration unwisely ended payments to the Car Car Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility, CCRIF. Instead of admitting, instead of admitting that they were wrong, they continued to defend their catastrophic and risky mistake. Under the headline, the Caribbean's pioneering form of disaster insurance, the Economist magazine recently praised the region for this insurance, CCRIF. The Economist article noted, and I quote, on September 12th, before it could be reckoned how much damage Hurricane Irma had caused, Turks and Caicos got some heartening news. Within a fortnight, the tiny Caribbean territory would get $13.6 million to pay for disaster relief. Days earlier, Antigua, and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Anguilla were pledged $15.6 million. The sum, a substantial 1% of their combined GDP, won't come from foreign do-gooders. It is a reward for homegrown prudence. Go on, Mr. Speaker. Like 13 other members of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and Nicaragua, the four had been paying the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility. Created in 2007, it has so far doled out $69 million to places battered by storms, floods, and earthquakes. Unused funds are retained as reserves. Besides its own reserves, CCRIF can draw on around $140 million 
underwritten annually by reinsurers. The Economist magazine, the Economist article continued, spreading risk across CARICOM and beyond, CCRIF is open to associate members such as Anguilla and since 2015, the Central American countries has kept premiums affordable. <coughs> Parametric triggers release money automatically, depending on how severe a calamity is, rather than after a tedious damage assessment. That makes such cash available in critical early days. The Caribbean pioneered sovereign parametric insurance taken out by governments, <coughs> not companies or households, end quote. Mr. Speaker, CCRIF and the like are worthwhile system. According to Stefan Durkin, a disaster finance expert at Oxford University. Insurance has not replaced broader pre preparations for disaster. On the, on the contrary, Mr. Durkin observes, paying for insurances forces you to think what to insure and how to protect those assets. Some schemes dictate how payouts must be spent. The Economist added this very telling point. It stated, the Bahamas let its policy lapse and missed out on $32 million payout after Hurricane Matthew shocked it in 2016. In some territories, Irma has wiped out assets worth more than annual GDP. One second. CCRIF will cover a fraction of that. So could you As similar tragedies <laughs> grow more common with climate change, governments power. may increasingly re view premiums not as a cost, but as an investment. And Mr. Speaker, the member speaking from the floor, from his seat, asking whether I have anything to table, but at the end of my presentation, I will table, but I will read again for the records so you can see what mistake you've made and how you've given or lost, cost the Bahamas to lose $32 million. The Bahamas has paid its recent premium and will continue to be a part of the Caribbean catastrophic risk insurance facility. Because, because, you could stand if you want, you know. I got lots of time. If you want to, if you want to ask a question, stand. Because we are a far-flung archipelago <coughs> with many islands, we are negotiating to see if the Bahamas can be divided into three zones for the purpose of this facility. Mr. Speaker, the government is focused, resolute, and determined to improve the economic viability, vitality of the Bahamas and to improve the standard of living for all Bahamians. Our vision is the ongoing development and transformation of our economy through creating wealth and opportunity for more Bahamians, diversification within tourism, and boosting of new and other industries, and through the reform of public finances and the public sector. 
My government is bringing fiscal discipline and order to public finances. Such discipline and order is required to forestall dire economic consequences which can cripple growth and the longer term prospects of the country. If we do not get our econ economic house in order, the foundation and the house are at risk of collapse. Sadly, sadly, mm -hmm. the former government was reckless, wasteful, and incompetent when it comes to public finance. You want to object? <laughs> they were not stewards of good government. The previous five years, Mr. Speaker, the previous five years was the worst period of governance in the modern Bahamas. This administration is reining in public expenditure in order to provide for long-term growth and economic stability. We have created an economic council of the Bahamas which is providing advice on job creation and growth, which are critical to economic recovery. An ease of doing business committee has been appointed. Its mandate is to make specific recommendations to make it easier to do business in the country for Bahamians and foreign investors. Yep. My government will detail such efforts as they are implemented. We are laying the groundwork for the introduction of targeted tax incentives for inner city communities. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, development does not solely refer to public infrastructure and economic growth. Though both, both are essential for national development. As essential development also refers to the cultural and social habits and mindset which help to make a country successful and well-run. These habits include a population committed to education and learning, the rule of law, an efficient and effective public sector, the development of arts and culture, a commitment to civility and public cleanliness, and the cultivation of values like working together for the common good and social justice, and tolerance for and the celebration of diversity. Speaker, law and order are as essential for development. Moreover, when we ignore or disrespect law and order in small things, we tend to adopt this attitude with the bigger things. Mr. Speaker, I note today, I note today that the government intends to vigorously address traffic and motor vehicle violations, including tinted glasses, parking in handicapped spots, yes. broken lights, and other violations. There will be no toleration for traffic offenses. My government will amend existing laws to increase penalties for the infraction of laws dealing with a number of environmental issues. Those who ignore these laws will face legal consequences. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I advise the House that the government will continue to address 
the vexing issue of illegal migration. We will continue to concentrate on the Immigration Department with particular emphasis on the process for granting and renewing work permits and visas. We will continue to process permanent residency applications for those who have legally been in the Bahamas for an extensive period of time who have contributed to the Bahamas and satisfy the requirements. This is fair and just cause of action. We will also, we will also continue to grant citizenship to those who are legally entitled. <laughs> Ms. Speaker, I don't think some people understand what it's like when you're legally entitled to citizenship, but you do not have the proper documents, and as was pointed out, you cannot open a bank account, you cannot travel, you have difficulty entering the University of Bahamas, tertiary education, you are placed in no man's land. Until you live it, you don't understand it. We must be a country that abides by the rule of law. Those migrants who are here illegally must leave by December 31st, 2017. I repeat, those migrants who are here illegally must leave by December 31st, 2017. After which, they will be aggressively pursued and deported. This applies, Mr. Speaker, to all nationalities. Yes. Those Bahamians and residents who employ illegal migrants have until December 31st, 2017 yep. to regularize these individuals or stop employing them. I implore immigration officers to execute their duties in a professional and humane manner. Those who are illegally, those who illegally employ such migrants are legally liable and they will be prosecuted. We must be a country of law and order. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Par Liberal Party has a complicated legacy. The Progressive Liberal Party has a complicated legacy. It led the Bahamas to majority rule and independence. It was once the compelling voice against forces who denied the dignity of the majority of our people. However, Soon after taking power, the PLP was seduced by the narcotic unbridled power. They forgot that they ruled on behalf of the people. Deals were made to make PLPs rich. Policy was advanced to ensure PLP influence crept into every sector of our economy and society. The public service was stocked with political appointees who did not need to work in order to get ahead. Loyalty, loyalty to the chief was what was, what was most important. It did, not, it did not matter if you came to your government job on time. It did not matter if you showed up at all. When you did turn up, 
You could run your own business out of the state's offices. One could use government's, government supplies and equipment at will. The PLP looked the other way. It was primarily concerned with, get, with getting rich. Many standards fell dramatically. Our culture was harmed. <coughs> Some of them got in bed with international drug traffickers who were allowed to set up shop on our islands, shipping untold millions of dollars worth of poison to North America. Some of the poison stayed here, bringing ruin to many young and promising Bahamians. Some PLPs get extremely rich, got extremely rich in this illicit trade. The PLP at the highest levels turned a blind eye to this cauldron of drugs and corruption and its devastating effect on our children, on our values, and on our good name as a country. Many Bahamians developed the misguided view that hard work was not needed to succeed. Fast money was what was sought. Again, standards fell. Our culture was degraded. Much of our social fabric was ripped apart. The party that was charged with making this nation great perverted it. Today, our streets are violent. Our education standards are low. Corruption is a way of life for too many, especially those who have gotten away with their corrupt ways for decades. But, Mr. Speaker, this is a new day. My government will prosecute the corrupt. We will make the privileged ones pay their bills just as ordinary behemoths must pay their bills. No special list. We will vigorously fight crime and its causes through policing, by working for judicial reform with the courts, and through innovative social intervention programs, such as targeted programs for youth development. We will ensure the government only pays those who work. We will not place harsh taxes on the people and then give their hard-earned dollars away to cronies and those who easily get no-bid contracts. The PLP paid the foundation. The PLP laid the foundation right after they said pen. for much of the crime in our country. <laughs> they tolerated all manner of corruption for decades, including, including massive corruption in their last term. Let me repeat, Mr. Speaker, since, since Angliston may not have heard me. They tolerated all manner of corruption for decades including massive corruption in the last term. Wow. Yeah. They put up signs at roundabouts complaining about murder rates during the 2012 general election. And one of them was none other than the leader, the opposition himself, who was pictured, who was pictured in a photo in one of the daily newspapers, smiling as he helped to hold up one of the signs. He said at that time, he said at that time that this was in the interest of getting the truth out, yet the murder rate climbed on their watch. But in the so-called interest of getting the truth out, the PLP did not put up signs on the murder rate after they were elected. Some of the PLP are more interested in crime as a political issue 
than as serious than as a serious national security concern. <laughs> the FNM takes crime seriously, Mr. Speaker, when we are in or out of office, along with job and wealth creation. Combating crime is the utmost priority of this government. Mr. Speaker, as a young man, I came from a simple home, but I had a dream. Medicine and healing were among my passions. I want our young people to dream of being doctors and teachers, engineers and entrepreneurs, artists and hotel owners, marine biologists and fishermen, public officers and farmers. I want them to dream of building a more developed nation, yes. mm -hmm. one that can be an example to other small countries in the region and around the world. My government will invest in opportunity for our people. We seek a meritocracy. We will work every day to build a better and safer Bahamas. Everybody. We will create a fairer society, one which you do not need to know a politician in order to succeed. Where you do not need to belong to a particular political party to get fair play from your government. You don't need a letter from your MP to get a job. My administration will be dedicated to transforming our Bahamas into one of the best and most successful small countries in the world. This, Mr. Speaker, is the FNM's vision and mission. Mr. Speaker, before I close, the member for Cat Island, Rumpkins and Salvador, the leader of the opposition, had asked me to table this communication Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility. I'll read two paragraphs from this. It was after you lost the election. <laughs> <laughs> we are pleased. It's going to be tabled. It's going to be tabled. We are pleased that the Bahamas has been a member of CCRIF since its inception in 2007. We are pleased that the government purchased tropical cyclone hurricane policies every year between 2007 and 2014, and also purchased policies for both tropical cyclones and excess rainfall for the year 2015-2016. However, however, we deeply regret that the government decided not to renew its CCRIF policies for the 2016-17 year, resulting in the Bahamas missing out on two CCRIF pay payouts from Tropical Cyclone Matthew. We obtained a good appreciation of the impact of this event on your country when we ran the CCRIF loss module <coughs> for TC Matthew with respect to the Bahamas, the CCRIF model picked up significant losses in Bahamas Central, West, and Bahamas North. Based on the registered losses, it means, it means that had the government of the Bahamas renewed its tropical cyclone policy for 2016-17 using the previous year's policy conditions, attachment point, exhaustion point, and premium, 
the policy would have triggered resulting in a payout of approximately $31.8 million equal to the coverage limit, coverage limit. This would have been the single biggest payout ever made by CCRIF to any country. The Bahamas Excess Rainfall Policy would have also triggered resulting in a payout of $855,874. Of course, those payouts would have been larger depending on the coverage purchase. And I'm going to table it so you can read the rest. Let's see, Order that the document be brought up. Mr. Speaker, you know, you know what that $32 million could have done for Grand Bahama or the rest of Bahamas? Honorable you Member. The Guardian. Just a moment. Order that the document do lie on the table. The document is dated the 31st of May, 2017. And you're talking about the Guardian. If that article is right, you would add 34 million plus an additional 32. <laughs> Thank you, and may God bless you. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Cat Island, Rumkins, and Salvador. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether, I, I thank the Prime Minister for laying that letter on the on the table, we'll have a look at it, and I will definitely have to have a response to it later. But I wonder whether he'll also lay on the table the advice that was given by the committee to the PLP cabinet, and the advice that was given to yourselves just before you would have uh, renewed the the the, the, uh, the insurance. We like to have it together. I would look at it. Um, but Mr. Speaker, I only want to remind the leader that in a few weeks, he may be, may remain in that post. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, I want to inform you that leadership is about taking advice. But you must make the decision. We made our decision. <laughs> And, and, so, and so did we make our decision. And I, and I just trust mm -hmm. that. And, and, I, and I trust. And, and, I, and I trust. And I, and I, and I trust that you, when you receive the, the IMF advice, you'll make a decision. As many? <laughs> Order that the following me message. Okay. Mm -hmm. As many as are in favor with the resolution to thank the Governor General. Uh, who could remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. <clears throat> the resolution is agreed and it is ordered that the following message be forwarded to Her Excellency the Governor General. And the message reads as follows. Message to Her Excellency Governor General from the Speaker and Representatives of the Honorable House of Assembly. May it please your Excellency, the House of Assembly 
beg to thank Your Excellency for the most gracious speech with which Your Excellency was pleased to open the present session of Parliament, dated the 11th of October, 2017. Further resolutions? Speaker. Member statements? Appointments of select committees? Instructions to select committees? Discharge of select committees? Notices for future meetings? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Exuma and Ragged Island. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The opposition wish to make notice of the following questions uh, for future meetings, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the Prime Minister or relevant Minister confirm its government's intention to proceed with the implementation of income tax in line with the IMF suggestion? Two. Two. Would the Prime Minister or relevant Minister confirm whether the government intends to disband NHI, including the progress made to date by the former government, as a part of its austerity measures? Three, would the Prime Minister or relevant Minister confirm its intention to terminate Bahamians in order to cut the civil service by 30 to 40 percent in line with the IMF's recommendation? and the Minister of Finance's recent announcement of strategy of expense cuts on the IMF's suggestion to reduce the wage bill. Four, would the Prime Minister or relevant Minister outline its specific economic plans that will redeploy the persons terminated from the civil service? Five, in recognition of the IMF's continued encouragement to cut expenditure, would the Prime Minister advise whether the Ministry of Financial Services Immigration and industry is exempt from such cuts as seemingly suggested by the said minister in the press. Six, in view of the IMF's advice against exemption from VAT, would the government advise whether it intends to follow through with the campaign promises of eliminating VAT on breadbasket items, on electricity, etc.? Seven, would the prime minister or relevant minister outline specifically A, the accounting basis that is being used by the Ministry of Finance. B, if changed, why was it changed? C, if changed, advised whether the government is using selective segments of the new basis. And D, if changed, state whether it is the government's intention to use this basis for its entire term. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Total of seven. You're going to be different, though. <laughs> You'll be different. Uh, 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 order that the notice be brought up. Order that the notice to lie on the table. Um, um, ju just a moment, please. Can I, can I have a look at that? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, for, the, for the notices. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rum, Kings, and Salvador. Uh, questions to the Minister responsible for national insurance. Um, could the Minister advise whether members representing, representing the insured persons were appointed to the National Insurance Board after consultation with an association of trade unions, representative, representative of the insured persons generally, and yeah, 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 that's true, uh, uh, and yeah, yeah, and uh, secondly, would the minister identify those members if they were so appointed? And I ordered that the notice be brought up. No, this. I, 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 I have it my, I have my own handwriting. Uh, what's the date? The date is what? That's okay. Yeah, that's right. That could be. 
Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker. The Chair, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Speaker, I rise to renew all matters in the name of the government and to signal that we intend to proceed at the next sitting of the House with one, a bill, um, the Gaming House Operations Amendment Regulations. Two, we intend to proceed with a bill for an act for the designation of specified commercial enterprises and specified commercial economic zones in the Bahamas. Three, we intend to proceed with a bill for an act to amend the Companies Act to provide for the registration of non-profit organization. Four, we intend to proceed with a bill for an act to provide for the Office of Ombudsman. Five, we're giving notice that we will lay them on the on Wednesday. We're just giving you notice that we intend to. We intend to lay them, yes. We may proceed with one or two, but we intend to lay them. So we'll have to have the discussion if there's agreement. We will lay them. Uh, five, Mr. Speaker, we intend to lay a bill for an act to repeal the Grand Bahama Port Area Investment Incentives Act and to provide for exemptions from certain taxes and rates. Six, we intend to lay a bill for an act to provide for the establishment of a body to be known as the Integrity Commission to promote and enhance ethical conduct for parliamentarians, public officials, and other persons to provide measures for the prevention, detection, and investigation of acts of corruption, and to repeal the Public Disclosure Act and to provide for matters connected thereto. Mr. Speaker. Oh, oh. How did the notice be brought up? Order that the notice do lie on the table. Oh. Further notices for future meetings. None. Adjournment. Mr. Speaker, I rise and do move that the House now adjourn until Wednesday, the 18th of October, 2017, at 10 a.m. It has been moved and seconded that the business of the House adjourn to Wednesday, 18th of October, at 10 a.m. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. Final adjournment. Mr. Speaker, I do rise and move that the House now adjourn. It's been moved and seconded that the House do now adjourn. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. The business of the House stands adjourned until Wednesday, the 8th. The 18th of October, 2017, at 10 a.m. And at that time, honorable members, you can wish me a great day. <laughs>